Ladies and gentlemen, we begin this webinar in the next 30 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this webinar. My name is Ajit Thomas, and I'm the director of the Faculty of Law at Manav Rachna University. At the very outset, may I take this opportunity to thank all of you for your support to this initiative, which is the second in a series of back to basic webinars dealing with fundamental concepts relating to the practice of law. The first in the series of webinars was held on the 3rd of May, which was a masterclass on the fundamentals of pleadings with Justice Pradeep Nandrajo as the resource person. Today's webinar will focus on the fundamentals of examination in chief and cross-examination in a civil suit. And to take you through this nuts and bolts topic, we have with us a former Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court and a sitting judge of the Delhi High Court. And I must say that we are extraordinarily privileged to have both of these gentlemen with us today on this webinar. Most of you know the two gentlemen very well, but to those few of you who do not, here's a little more about our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Justice Pradeep Nandra Jog, who recently retired as the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court. Before moving to the Bombay High Court, Justice Pradeep Nandajog served as the Chief Justice of the Rajasthan High Court for two years and as a judge of the Delhi High Court for more than a decade. Friends of mine who had the opportunity of appearing before Justice Nandajog have had great things to say about his wit, his erudition, and mastery over matters relating to trials and civil procedure. Our second speaker for today is Mr. Justice Rajiv Sahai N. Law. With a name, with a surname like N. Law, it is, it, it is no surprise that Justice N. Law has ended up being a sitting judge of the Delhi High Court. Justice N. Law did his LLB from Campus Law Center, New Delhi. Um, he enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Delhi way back in 1982. He was elevated as a judge of the Delhi High Court in 2008 after having served for more than 25 years as an advocate with a practice specializing in the trial of civil disputes. Ladies and gentlemen, the student community in Delhi till date very fondly remembers Justice N. Law for his 2016 decision in University of Oxford versus Rameshwar Photocopy Services. This was a decision, ladies and gentlemen, where Justice N. Law had held that photocopying portions of books, especially textbooks and reference books, even if by a commercial photocopier for sale to students of a university would not amount to the infringement of copyrights. Ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed very privileged to have these two gentlemen as our distinguished speakers for today's webinar. And to moderate this webinar, we are delighted to have two young stars of the Delhi Bar, Shashank Garg. Shashank is a young but very seasoned dispute resolution practitioner, and he's currently a partner with Advani & Co. He's also a member of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR, and is on the Arbitration Committee of the Delhi International Arbitration Center. He's a certified mediator and the author of two very popular law books, one on ADR, and the other, interestingly, on tourism laws. Our second moderator is Kanika Singh. I dare not say anything about the beauty of Kanika, <laughs> but as you can see, she is a young, Aman. but very dynamic and articulate independent advocate practicing at the Delhi High Court. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I now hand over this webinar to our star moderators for today. Shashank and Kanika, over to you. 
Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for such an elaborate introduction to our distinguished panelists. Uh, without wasting too much time, I'll kickstart the proceedings and would request uh, Honorable Justice N. Lo, who will cover his experience as a lawyer while covering the subject at hand, that is the fundamentals of examination in chief and cross-examination in a civil suit. Over to you, sir. Hi, Sushant. Thank you. And good afternoon to everybody. And Mr. Thomas, you mentioned the photocopy case. Let me tell you that uh, Justice Nandra Jod was a appellate court in that. <laughs> so, so you have the uh, two courts which uh, dealt with that matter before you. Of course, he was in a division bench, division is a judge, but uh, he was the appellate court in that case. Now, friends, uh, the stage of uh, evidence, see a lot of uh, importance of that stage is uh, being diluted now with uh, most of the communications being in the electronic form and uh, which uh, is really bringing down the importance of the stage. But still a large number of issues, especially relating to uh, non-commercial matters remain, in which uh, uh, there is still a lot of importance of uh, verbal evidence, documentary evidence I'm proceeding on the premise that uh, the documentary evidence by and large will now get over with the law, so we'll settle about the aspect of admissibility and proof. Now, why I say that uh, this is a very important stage is for the reason that it is also perhaps the last stage at which you can correct the errors of any in your claim and defense. So it is always good to examine because invariably the stage of evidence is reached after about one year of institution of the suit. So you are wiser even if you have yourself instituted the suit during interaction with the client. A lot of other things may have come to your notice or while preparing evidence, other facts or factors may come to your notice, which you may like to add if it is required to be incorporated in the pleadings. Now, what I also find is that uh, evidence is not to be uh, prepared merely by the uh, pleadings. A lot of times what happens that the suits or the written statements are filed in a hurry and the case law is not checked at that time or the law is not fully studied. So one has to study the law all over again on the matter and then with reference to the ingredients which the law requires for a particular claim or a particular defense to succeed, you have to see that which of those ingredients is admitted in the, by the opposite party, whether those ingredients are pleaded or not, and how best whatever is not admitted, whichever ingredient without which you cannot succeed, how it can be best proved. So all that work has to go before preparing the affidavit with, by way of examination in chief. The second important thing which I would like to highlight is that uh, a lot of affidavits by way of examination in chief are today found to be one vacuum copy of the pleadings. So it's always better to confer with the client and to dictate the affidavits by way of examination in chief in the presence of the witness whose affidavit is being drafted. Because a lot of times what I have experienced that the witness may tell you that no, I'm not going to say this or I'll be caught on this if I put it like this. So then you have to change and say it in a different way. Then another stage which I find uh, of leaving evidence which is often neglected is tendering of the affidavit. 
by way of examination in chief. The stage of tendering assumes significance in the matter of proof of documents because at the time when the affidavit is prepared or affirmed, the documents are on the court record and are not there. So you may be required to identify the document, have the document identified by the witness in the court record and point the marks where the signatures identified by the mark. So these are what I would say in a nutshell about the examination in chief. Now, cross-examination, I would just like to share. See, I always felt that cross-examination is something which is very innate to a human being. We are all used to asking. We don't take anything for face value. Whenever we are told anything, we always ask why or how. Now, the only reason we are not able to do it so well relating to a professional client is because we are the facts don't relate to us. The facts relate to a third party. And unless we master the facts ourselves, we will not be able to you. So a cross-examination is a cross-examination is literally to get into the skin of the client and to look at the facts from the eyes of the client. In fact, I have always maintained that cross-examination is taught to all of us right from kindergarten. I give the example of the poem which we are taught of Johnny Johnny Yes Papa. It, according to me, is nothing but cross-examination because the father of the a father of Johnny literally gets the truth out of the mouth of Johnny, who is denying the fact. So the purpose of cross-examination is that whatever has been deposed by the witness, which is not correct according to record, you have to lead the witness to take out that truth from him. And again, I emphasize that the <clears throat> cross-examination is always lacks if there is a lack of communication you don't sit down with the client or with the witnesses of the client who are in the know of facts to find out about the witness to be cross-examined uh, on the next day and that's why you are unable to not take out the truth from the witness only one other point i would like to make about the cross-examination uh, what has worked with me is to always prepare the notes for cross-examination, leaving it to one's memory to at the spur of the moment ask the questions, even if you know your meanings. According to me, often leaves a lot of lacunas because in cross-examination, not only what you ask is important, but the form in which you ask and the chronology in which you ask is very important. Unless you lead the witness to something after which what he has said contradicting you is obviously false. The witness, you cannot expect that if you put to him that what you are saying is wrong, it will at best be no, that is not correct. So this is what I would like to, what I feel are the basic principles to be uh, remembered for examination and cross-examination. Thank you, Shashank. Thank you, sir. May I now request uh, Mrs. Nanduju, sir, if you could also uh, give some of those interesting anecdotes which uh, I had the uh, occasion of hearing in some of our previous meetings would be very useful, <laughs> including the story of that businessman wearing a dhoti, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Justice Sandlow, for having a very well penned profile the importance of examination in chief and cross examination at civil trials. Um, I would just start like this that when we say what should a plaint contain? A plaint should contain all statements of fact 
which if traversed would be required to be proved to sustain the claim. Therefore, it logically follows that in an examination in chief, all those facts which have been traversed are proved. Now you see, as it is said, that in all human affairs, absolute certainty is a myth. And as Professor Brett said, all exactness is a fake. So the great writer E.L. Durando said that absolute proof being unattainable, it becomes the compulsion of law to accept probability as the touchstone on which we will determine whether a fact has been proved or has not been proved. And that is exactly what we find is the definition of the word proved and in section three of the Indian Evidence Act, it says that where the trier of a fact in issue has a set of material before him, should he act on the supposition that the fact in dispute exists or not? So with these two fundamentals, we understand that examination in chief obviously has to be directed by the plaintiff to prove the facts in issue and obviously an attempt by the defendant to disprove those facts in issue. As Justice Handler rightly pointed out that in a very few civil cases, maybe like family disputes, Talking of commercial disputes, we find everything is coming in the form of documentary evidence. So in family disputes where oral evidence is there, the examination in chief has to obviously center around the conduct of the parties. What was the course of conduct which they adopted before they came into the dispute? which obviously would be facts to the personal knowledge of those who had viewed the conduct. When it comes to documentary evidence, we have a very illuminating decision of the Supreme Court way back in 1958. It's reported as 1958 SCR Supreme Court reports 328 Mubarak Ali Ahmed versus State of Bombay. That was the case where Mubarak Ali, when at Karachi, had held out to the complainant that he was possessing large quantities of rice. He took the money and he did not supply the rice. And the complaint was lodged and obviously the trial centered around the documents which the complainant had handed over they consisted of signed letters, letters purportedly signed by Mubarak Ali. Some of them were unsigned communications. Some of them were telegrams. And how would you prove? It was a problem the partition had taken place. The Supreme Court said that proof of genuineness of a document is obviously a proof of the authorship of the document. And we find that four very illuminating guiding principles were laid down. The first was direct evidence by a person who saw the document being scribed or the signatures being affixed by the person who is purported to be the author of the document. Now, in such a case as Mubarak Ali's case, since the documents were prepared and transmitted from Karachi, there was no witness available. The Supreme Court said you could follow the next principle of internal evidence afforded by the contents of the document itself, where the disputed document purports to be a link 
in the chain of correspondence, some links being proved to the satisfaction of the court. So even if some links are proved to the satisfaction of the court, the court would then fall back upon the illustration of the under section 114 that the court may presume that ordinary course of business was followed. The third guiding principle laid down was general circumstances embombing the document in an appropriate case where it is established that the document constitutes a link in the chain of correspondence and from this authorship could be determined and obviously the fourth is expert evidence now today we find that most of the documentary evidence is electronically created electronically stored and electronically generated how do we prove the genuineness of this document now the flavor of electronically created documents could be numerous it could be emails web pages text messages digital voice recordings database compilations digital photographs digital voices computer logs and call records now we have section 2c of the information technology act defines electronic record to mean data and all these things which i have spoken we're talking of proof let's have a look to section 61 to section 65 they are relevant for the deal with proof of contents of document primary and secondary evidence with emphasis on proof of documents by primary evidence with the contours of secondary evidence being as per section 65 and section 65a and 65b deal with the proof of documents now section 6 to section 36 of the evidence act which deal with facts which are relevant to the facts in issue can be proved to determine a fact in issue and a fact in issue we all understand is a fact affirmed by one side and denied by another sign. With this theoretical framework created by the law of evidence, we must take into account that order 18 rule 4 of the Civil Procedure Code talks of affidavit by way of evidence. And keep in mind, as Justice and Law rightly pointed out, witnesses have to speak with reference to their personal knowledge so rule 9 of order 19 stipulates that while drafting the affidavit by way of examination in chief the witness must be deposing facts which are personal to his knowledge and thereby excludes hearsay argumentative statements in the affidavit and statements of law in fact sub rule 2 of rule 3 of order 19 casts an obligation on the court to not only impose costs and strike out those statements which are stated in the affidavit by way of evidence which are hearsay which are argumentative and which are not to the personal knowledge of the witness. Having said that, it becomes a very, very simple exercise. But simple exercises, as Justice Handlaw rightly pointed out, needs hard work. You have to keep into account what law mandates to be proved for a claim to be sustained and therefore all such evidence which is evidence of directly of the fact in issue or of a fact which is relevant to the 
fact in issue to be stated. Now, for example, the authorship of a document is an issue. And let's take the document has emanated from the defendants. The defendant scribed the document in his office. He signed the document in his office and he transmitted it to the plaintiff. Unfortunately for the plaintiff, the dishonest defendant has denied the authorship of that document and obviously has denied that he transmitted the document. The plaintiff would have to prove two things that the defendant scribed the document, executed the document, or got it scribed and signed the document and transmitted it to him. The fact that it was with the plaintiff itself is proof of the fact that such a document unless it could be transmitted unless the defendant says well i prepared it but i didn't send it and this fellow crawled into my office in the night and stole it that situation apart how would the plaintiff prove it very simple statements in the affidavit by way of evidence that my first dealings with the defendant started in such and such year and my first contract was which was drawn up in his office he signed that document in my presence and i recognize his signatures so that document of the first contract would be relevant because it's a relevant fact because this witness now says that when that document was drawn up, the defendant signed it in my presence and I am familiar with his signatures. Then such other documents which bear the signatures of the defendant, for example, they may have had a meeting in relation to their contract. They drew up the minutes which was signed in their presence. He must say that, that it was signed by the defendant and he must then push in as many documents, not overloading the court, a good eight or ten of them contemporaneous to the time when this document which the defendant has denied was executed and tell the judge and of course the law says that a judge can even visually look at the signatures on the admitted documents or such other documents which are proved by a witness to compare with this. Then coming to the transmission part of it. Well, you can give a notice under Order 12 Rule 8 to the defendant to produce his dispatch registers. After all, he's in business. And if he just and he says, I don't uh, maintain a dispatch register, the court will keep into mind that in ordinary course of business people do maintain their dispatch registers if for no other reason to put into their expenditure the postal charges incurred in transmitting documents to post alternatively the plaintiff can state that they in their office maintain in the ordinary course of business a receipt register. The extract of the receipt register would then be exhibited because that would be personal to his knowledge, showing that on a date which the disputed document purports to bear, there is an entry in the receipt register in the plaintiff's office. So that is how logically. And simple as that, how would a reasonable human being infer a particular fact? So, for example, if you're walking down to the court in the Delhi High Court through the chamber, through the canteen, and at 10 o'clock you find a lawyer having a hearty breakfast, you're bound to say, Ah, oh, Bhabi Ji ne khana nahi khala hai. You don't have breakfast today. How are you inferring that he didn't have a breakfast? Because you are seeing him 
at 10 o'clock ordering a double leg omelet, a plate of bread pakora, and a plate of sandwiches and gulping it down with hot coffee. So at base as what does this, and Lord rightly pointed out, what you really need to do is a proper client conference. On that, I would only have one thing to state. You have cases, I saw it as a lawyer many a times, while drafting a plaint or a written statement, I would normally quiz the plaintiff or such people whom the plaintiff wanted to cite as their witnesses. And all human beings are not the same. Some have feet of quicksand, they tend to slip, they get nervous. So I would always try to say that, can you substitute a better witness for me if in my chamber, in a non hostile environment, the fellow is shaky. The fellow is so shaky. How do you expect such a witness to stand in a court of law? So having said that, just a word on cross-examination. By and large, your client has told you the truth. And the problem which the lawyer finds is that unfortunately in India, we are most unofficious when it comes to our commercial transactions and which unfortunately I find is extremely true even for large multinational companies. There, if you find that there are certain gaps which are natural, which are capable of being explained as a result of the unofficious conduct, please do not try to puff up by putting in false facts. Let the natural gaps remain. And it's like joining the dots. So if eight dots have to be joined, and if you find that in between two, there is a gap, no issue on that, it'll get through. But to prepare for a cross-examination, so let's say your client tells you this part of the story is true. This part of the story is not true. It is now being pushed in by oral evidence. That is why you would see in the Delhi High Court you have part A witnesses, part B witnesses, part C witnesses, part D witnesses. A smart lawyer would always do wherever there would be gaps, he would put in his part D witnesses to fill up the gaps, which would be there in the documentary evidence. Now in such a case, good cross-examination. So I was in the second part of it. Many a times you find that a person says, I wrote the letter, but actually, somebody else in his office had drafted that letter and he had penned his signatures onto that document. So he loosely says, I am the author of the document. He's an author of the document in a way, yes, because he has signed it, he's executed the document, but the scribe was somebody else. So you can now adopt a line of cross examination to choose between discrediting the testimony of the witness or discrediting the witness himself. <laughs> because cross-examination says it has not to be restricted to the facts which the witness has deposed. You can put him all kinds of questions. You can confront him even with documents which have not been filed. Now so there if you find that the witness has signed the document, but he has not scribed the document, lead him into it. Also, you call the Seno and you dictated it, the witness will 
say yes i call my steno or he'll say i typed it myself because i'm very good become a linguistic expert you have cases where people have this habit of making stupid spelling mistakes like for example lose so l o s e is lost l o o s e is lose so if you're wearing a loose pants you would lose your pants so l o o s e pants worn would be a pants l o s e so you will find so you write on a, a sheet of paper and just tell the witness i will find that kind of cross examination being done is this sentence right he will say yes it is right are the spellings of the words right he will say right and then you would find out and show that in this particular document which he claims that he authored it the spellings are not what this witness is saying time is short but at base what it emerges is that the hard work which starts at the drafting of your claim or your plaint where all facts required to be proved is traversed have to be pleaded all those facts have to be proved and the role of the lawyer on the other side is that such facts which are puffed up which are false which are untrue to be demolished now Shashank, you said that uh, that example that anecdotes and of course uh, 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 no uh, teaching is complete till you don't give some kinds of uh, examples i don't know justice handlock would have also heard about that this um, trader had engulfed the trade union leader into multifarious defamation suits criminal and civil so at a pre-charge evidence the lalaji came into the witness box so he had to talk of defamation so he had to talk of his standing in the society so he said that i am the owner of so many factories i'm the owner of so many properties i pay so much of tax i give so much money in charity i'm involved in so many uh, with so many charitable organizations and i give so much donation to the charitable organizations and then of course he said that at such and such place in the union uh, when the uh, workers were present he gave a very uh, a speech against the to the workmen it was in uh, a speech which was to uh, um, rouse the workmen against me he wanted to go on a strike and so on and so forth so he said all that so during cross-examination the lawyer the third question was he said lalaji ye jo dhoti tumne pehni hai ye baas maar rahi hai ye meli hai ye aad jagah se rafood hai aur abhi bhi do jagah se phati hui hai so the judge knew it was wrong so the judge told the stereotype it it is wrong to suggest that the dhoti which i am wearing hasn't been washed for two months I deny that it is soil. I deny that it is roughwood at eight places, and I deny it is stone at two places. So when the steno typed it, the judge said, "What next?" He said, "No, my lord. Thoti exhibit DW one by one, a PW one slash A. The thoti has been now exhibited. At the stage of arguments, we will see. Lala ji, ab thoti to utar ni padegi." So he took out a gamcha and he told the Lalaji, Ab ab gamcha pen ke jayenge. The Lalaji had no option but to withdraw the civil suit, the criminal trial. Well, personally, I have seen as a lawyer also, I read one matter where ONGC was on the other side. It was an oil drilling contract where the American company people, everything went bad about that oil drilling and the blame game started it was entirely the fault of my clients 
But there was only one thing which I was seeing in that case. Would the lawyer on the other side catch it? Ditch magnets had to be put when the material from the core of the earth after the oil well was being drilled had to be pushed out by polymers and then through a sieving tank it was pushed back once again because the pressure of the polymer was also used for the kinetic energy to be using the movement of the bits and at the catchment tank the ditch magnets had to be put and my client had not put the ditch magnets and as a result the little chippings from the uh, the the rope they call it but it's actually in the nature of a pipe which is used to lower the pit into the well and little metallic pieces which come out from the womb of the soil were re-entering and destroying the forehead when the forehead was weak it was just being drilled one question if had been put to my client did you or did you not put the ditch magnets so it again boils down to what justice and law said every strand has to be picked up sieved up stitched up and a neat packaging material unfortunately what we are saying is nobody is looking at that gem inside everybody is so concerned with the packaging material of your plaint and the packaging material of your affidavit by way of evidence i'm sorry to say and justice and would agree with me that 90 percent cases the examination in chief is a verbatim reproduction of the plaint that should not happen thank you for having given me this opportunity to share one little anecdote and be a little uh, legalistic about it but uh, i thought it was the same thank you sir yes sir honorable justice and law i believe you want to say something so the me I'm sorry, I was on mute. I didn't realize. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have time to share two instances? Uh, Absolutely. Which I, which I think illustrate what I said about getting into the skin of the client very well. Uh, see, uh, one of the cases uh, is of the rent control era when the bona fide requirement cases used to be contested tooth and nail, and. Uh, my client was a corporate and the landlady was residing with her daughter granddaughter in chandigarh and the case for requirement was that the granddaughter has taken admission in delhi university in a postgraduate course and therefore they want to shift to their house in vasant vihar now there was no defense the admission documents were there i told my clients to check her attendance attendance was also there but uh, you know every date when they used to come from chandigarh uh, to, to the court for the hearing i used to notice that another young boy he used to fly in i knew he used to fly in because he used to he proudly used to carry his j class card in his in the top pocket of his shirt and uh, that girl the granddaughter and that boy one could make out they would be talking to each other throughout they were hardly bothered about the case they would push off i could hear overhear them to maidens for a coffee or whatever for lunch so i asked my client that is she engaged to be married to this person you know in a corporate nobody is really concerned so they couldn't find out but when she came in the witness box and this boy was also standing there and i asked her that uh, are you engaged to this person and she couldn't say no and we succeeded in that case 
uh, merely by that observation which the client also did not know. Now the other place where I suffered very badly and perhaps that case must have been lost because uh, I left it when I took up this job was it was a suit for specific performance of a very big property in Narayana and the same consideration was very high. The plaintiff, I was for the defendant in that, the plaintiff used to come to the court along with his wife on each and every date of hearing and from the attire of the plaintiff and his wife, nobody could say that he would have that 20 crores, 25 crores for which he had agreed to purchase, the, entered into the agreement to purchase and the state of pleadings and the documents was very, very poor. His advocate had not said anything. Even an examination in chief, he did not say anything at all, except for saying that I have the sources. No document was proved. And you know, I was so misguided by his appearance that I kept on asking. He always used to carry a leather bag with him. I don't know whether you people have noticed, not any fancy, just a leather bag, which a lot of uh, elderly residents carry, used to carry at that time. And I asked him about his, he said that, uh, did you have a bank account at that stage? He said, yes, but did you, uh, are you carrying the passport? See, his lawyer was not wise, but he was very wise. Each and every document came out from his that leather bag and I was totally demolished. I damaged my own case. So I'm just telling you that how the cross-examination or the evidence can work wonder or it can also sometimes without proper information damage one's case. Sorry, I took, took up some time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those examples. And thank you, Honorable mm -hmm. Justice Nandalo, for this succinct uh, overview of the statutory provisions as well as the anecdotes, which helped us understand a little better. Uh, now, just moving on straight away to some questions, which hopefully would help us understand this a little more better. My first question is <coughs> to Honorable Justice Enlo. Uh, so the question is, and this is a little basic and stemming from what you had said about the importance of uh, the stage of tendering and uh, ma uh, evident, uh, marking your documents. What questions can uh, the lawyer of a witness, uh, the, uh, what questions can the lawyer of the opposite party, say if it's the defendant in case of uh, the plaintiff's witness, take with regards to objecting of tendering of documents other than motive proof? And there's also another question merging with no, that other than, Sorry, other, other, than, than? other than motive proof. Yes. And so there's also another question, which is uh, which has also come from the audience, which I'm uh, keeping with this question only, is that how fatal is not objecting to exhibiting of documents when some judgments, including the judgment of the Honorable High, uh, Delhi High Court in Sudin Engineering versus Nitco Ra Roadways, has held that exhib exhibiting will not mean proof of the documents, and anyway those documents would have to be proved. So if I, uh, or my lords can consider answering these questions. See, the uh, first uh, question, the objections can be qua non-admissibility, non-admissibility can be on the ground of non-stamping or non-registration. They can be on the ground of the document having not been filed at the proper stage. That can be another act because primarily all these objections are about the mode of proof. But you are asking besides the mode of proof, uh, another objection can be that the document is not primary evidence and the notice to produce and uh, the original has not been given. Then nowadays in the context of electronic evidence, uh, objection can also be that the 65B certificate is not there. Then, uh, though that's not very common, uh, but there can be objection about privilege. For instance, if the document relates to a communication between spouses or uh, communication between the lawyer and the client. So this is what immediately comes to my mind. These are the few other grounds besides mode of proof. Yes, one other can be uh, 
this though it's uh, the law with respect to that is not very clear in india as yet but uh, that the document has been procured illegally so that doctrine which is there of fruit of a forbidden tree so that is also required to be taken now as far as the object the effect of not taking that objection is concerned see there are some matters which go to the very root for instance if a document is not stamped or not registered and it is barred from being admitted into evidence not taking the objection at that stage may not be so relevant but uh, a lot of other grounds they would stand waived if you don't raise an objection at that stage so it is according to me very important because if you had taken the objection the argument would be that perhaps the opposite party would have got the document proved in a better way or in a proper way but you allowed the document to be admitted into evidence without objecting to it so therefore at the stage of final arguments you cannot take that objection so it depends upon the nature of the objection uh, primary or secondary my view is that uh, you can lose that right once you do not object, object to uh, a secondary evidence document being taken on record so always safest to take the objection thank you sir shashank yeah, uh, i have a question for just one thing to add on what kanika said a lot of lawyers have a very wrong opinion if a document is exhibited and it is proved it doesn't mean that the contents of the documents are also proved for example in a matter where a plaintiff had made wrong assertions of the current facts to the defendant like for example the plaintiff says in a letter that on such and such date when i went to the defendant's factory to see whether the defendant is in the state of preparedness to supply the goods to me which was three days off from the date of the contract i found that his factory was closed and the man at the gate told me he saw this factory like closed for 10 days that letter has been sent the defendant says this was a mischievous letter sent by him he knew i was in the state of preparedness this guy didn't have the money the document would be exhibited the document would be proved but that doesn't mean that the plaintiff's assertion that when he went to the defendant's factory three days prior he found that the factory was closed so we must draw these distinctions the proof of a document is the proof of the contents of the document limited only that yes this document has that content whether the assertion of that content is correct or not is little different that's why you know we say in the delhi high court document admitted contents denied document admitted contents contents denied it was in this context when it was said. right thanks so, sushant you want to ask question? question for you uh, for justice nandajo if during cross examination a witness makes a statement contradictory to the affidavit should the counsel confront the witness there and then uh, or should he wait to address this during the uh, final arguments to show that uh, the testimony of the witness was colored as he was giving contradictory statements because giving him an opportunity at that stage could be fatal obviously of course it would be extremely fatal if a witness you see law only states that if a witness has made a previous statement and you want to use that previous statement against the witness then law says that you have to confront the witness with the previous statement and he can explain that under what circumstances he made the statement but if as a part of his examination in chief and cross examination he contradicts himself then i think it would be fatal to keep on asking the witness further supplementary questions and giving the witness an opportunity to correct it you should leave your cross examination there and then just a just a follow up on that uh, requesting justice law to comment 
sir uh, where do we draw line between uh, tutoring the witness and uh, preparing the witness <laughs> not the line but also practical line See, uh, tutoring the witness would be to tell him to say something which is uh, which uh, which is not a fact or what he has told you is not the fact. So tutoring, according to me, is confined to that only. But preparing the witness is a very important stage. According to me, if uh, we put a person who is not used to the court in the witness box, you know, we are all used to in our daily conversation, we don't give reply in full sentences. We would uh, uh, say somebody said, is that correct? We'd say, yeah, so. So when the answers are recorded, because in the court generally it is recorded verbatim what the witness has said, a lot of courts are now recording evidence in question answer form. So at the stage of final arguments, when you reach such answers, you know, the testimony it doesn't give the ring of truth for the judges or the arbitrators to act on the basis of that. So it is always better to tell the witness to uh, the manner in which it is to be answered, to understand a lot of us, uh, we respond we have, see, we are all very bad listeners. Uh, the anxiety is always to speak and to uh, give an answer without fully understanding the question. So preparing a witness, telling him that listen carefully, telling him that, look, this suggestions will be put, because that, though I, I'm of the view that suggestions serve no purpose, but unfortunately that remains the cross-examination to a large extent today. So all this is uh, the witness is not used to a person coming to the court for the first time. And he takes a lot of things which are in his mind to be a given and that I have engaged an advocate, even say all this. So the person needs to be told before going to the court that, look, this is how uh, it is going to play out. So you have to answer so that what is being written, you have to follow more time that what is written is what according to you had happened. When we read that after five years, we should be able to understand that yes, this had happened rather than leaving it ambiguous. So there is a vital difference and there is no harm in preparing a witness. All that is prohibited is that you should not tell him to tell a lie. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. So my next question is to Justin Nandrajog, and it's a little topical uh, given today's scenarios. Uh, so the question is, given today's scenario with the emphasis on virtual hearings, do you think cross-examination with its little nuances that are to be observed with regards to the demeanor of a witness, as well as the idea of putting the witness in a formal setting to elicit honest responses, do you think that get compromised in a virtual hearing perspective? And would it be possible to have cross-examinations on a virtual hearing platform? Let me answer it by prefacing one thing. The concept of a demeanor of a witness is relevant when the judge who is giving, the, authoring the final judgment is the judge who has recorded the evidence and he has seen the demeanor of the witness, which while writing the judgment, he could use. I haven't come across in the last now 30 years, any judgment being authored by any judge anywhere in the country where the judge has referred to the demeanor of the witness. And unfortunately, the reason is that the recording of evidence itself takes so much time that more than one judge tenure gets full. Number two, now, in civil trials, I don't find evidence being recorded in the court. It's all before the commissions. So this concept of a demeanor has in any case being lost. So whether it is in a virtual cross-examination going place or it is going place, taking place before the court commission. 
So to that extent, the issue of demeanor becomes a non-demeanor. The only problem could be confronting the document to a witness. A correction made, a typo error correct, corrected, or to read out a particular line and confront the witness. Theoretically, it is possible that the document can also be then loaded on, shown, and if you want to confront the witness with two lines, you can highlight those two lines, but it would make it extremely, extremely uh, uh, cumbersome. And one thing is there, we have seen that uh, uh, in an environment which is away from the court, the witnesses would, it'd be very easy for a witness to tell a lie. People have a lot of issues. Why do you have the grandeur of the court? Why should the judge be sitting on a dais? Why should the judge be wearing a, a black clothes, white shirt, and a band? You know, that degree of formality itself sends a signal to the witness that um, it, it's a solemn place. But otherwise, I think theoretically, it would be possible, but it would not be desirable. Thank you, sir. So my next question. Uh, may, may I just add to that? Uh, see, I feel uh, doing the cross-examination virtually would uh, literally destroy, and we might as well not do the cross-examination. Again, speaking uh, from personal experience, uh, I invariably in all important trials, and particularly the party witnesses who had never been to the court earlier. Uh, now I'm talking of the corporates where the person who is to actually depose the director, they generally don't come to the court at the preliminary stage. They come to the court only for the purposes of their evidence because in the facts, maybe no officer can give evidence. So what I have experienced with so I always used to tell them that, look, uh, if you want to see what is the court like, how does it happen? come one day earlier. So I would call them one day for half an hour just to show them the court and all. And I have had, uh, I would say at least half a dozen of those witnesses when uh, uh, they had before that when I was preparing them for their examination in chief. That time the examination in chief also used to be in the court, not by way of affidavit. So, you know, they said, no, sorry, I cannot make that statement. I am not going to lie on oath before a judge. So, what Justice Nandra Yog said, that the impacting cross, what is cross-examination? Cross-examination, like I was giving the example of Johnny, Johnny, yes, Papa. If Johnny had said that he is not eating sugar, he doesn't have sugar in his mouth. But in cross-examination, he was told to open his mouth and out came the sugar. So, when you have to do that, it's a mind game between the cross-examiner and the witness. And my experience has been, we have debated this in the courts and one of my colleagues deferred with me, that it makes a difference because if you people are familiar with the district courts or even in the high court, the witness box is always a little higher than where the lawyer stands. So I have noticed that it makes a difference whether the witness is standing higher than the cross-examining lawyer. So generally, I used to prefer to stand myself in the witness box and make that, because I, in any case, I have a short time, so there was no way I could guard over the witness. So it's best to stand yourself in the witness box put the witness outside and then cross-examine him. Similarly, uh, you know that whole thing of the judge's presence, a formal atmosphere, even if the, you are giving the statement recorded from the uh, stenographer or the typist or before a commissioner, all that makes a difference. So according to me, we are not ready in this uh, stage where Speaking a lie in the court is a norm. We are not ready, according to me, for cross-examination through video conferences. Because sitting in my own home, 
in my own chair, I would have no hesitation in saying anything. That is why in the rules which have been made for recording of evidence of witnesses via video conferencing, which till now we have confined generally to foreign witnesses or outstation witnesses who are unable to come to the court or to travel, we have provided for the cross-examination to be conducted in the presence of a, either a oath commissioner or a notary public or before the Indian Embassy or the High Commissioner so that the witness goes out of his comfort space into another space and then deposes. For instance, if I am to ask Sachan something, I don't even know whether he is reading out for some, from somewhere or somebody is sitting behind his chair holding a gun to him that Sachan, you have to speak like this. So all that is possible. <laughs> I, uh, if I don't want him to speak the truth, I would send somebody to his house and hold him to ransom to speak in my favor. <laughs> Just as Nandrajo wanted to say. I want you to say one thing. All this is good in theory, but Justice Sandlow would agree with me. I have seen now that in commercial civil litigation, the final arguments, there is no reference to the testimony of the witnesses at all. The entire argument mm -hmm. is, so the contract is admitted, so no dispute on that. In the working of the contract, this is what is in dispute. Can you see, I have written this letter to the other side. Receipt of the letter is admitted because with reference to my letter having reference number, the defendant has given a reply. Where out of four assertions of fact made by me in my letter, which is exhibit P1, he has only controverted two. Two he has not. See my response, which he admits because he's filed this document. My response is dealing with his response to only two. And then take the next letter in the sequence. While giving the response, he dilutes his response to point number one, which he disputed. This is what is going on. So today, I think we also have to put a question. Do we need examination in chief? Do we need cross-examination? when at the end of the day, it will all be sorted out with reference to the contents of the emails, the letters, the telegrams, the minutes of the meeting which have been uh, dropped. Much of it is becoming totally irrelevant. I'm not finding any judgments in commercial contracts with testimonies of the witnesses. Few, very few cases. And that also maybe half percent of the disputed fact being talked about. So I think if we all put our heads together, it's quite possible. And um, I don't know how long this COVID issue will go, how, how, how long the actual court sittings would not take place. The, uh, the vaccine may not come. It's staring us in the face. So can we have no trials for the next two years? I doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my next question is to Justice Enlow, and I'm taking a little cue from what Justice Nandrajog said with regards to what has become so superfluous. And Justice Enlow's views on this are a little clear with regards to the uh, the scope of suggestions in a civil trial. And uh, sir is also authored the judgment. So I just wanted to know, sir, do you think there are still any particular instances where suggestions would have a vital role to play in a civil trial? Or they are some they are something that should be completely not looked at and should not be preferred and can be completely ignored. See, to a limited extent, maybe depending upon the facts. Immediately I am unable to come up with any instance in which suggestion may be are required. But uh, otherwise, what is required to be done is to instead of uh, just putting to the witness that what you have said is wrong, you have to ask him the surrounding facts about which he may not have been told, prepared, as I said, that you have to be cautious about it, and to which he would answer correctly. And 
after he has reached a particular stage then if you give a suggestion and if even if he retracts his earlier statement then at the stage of argument you can argue that uh, look this answer is obviously false in the light of an other answers which he has given or the improbability of it else according to me it's a waste of time but let's have just as nandra jokes view on this i have already opined on it <laughs> so uh, i have a question yes yeah this is nandra joke i use adding to yes. what just stated or no, should i ask them you see i was only saying that theoretically suggestions have relevance theoretically it is possible that even in a documentary evidence examination in chief and cross examination would have relevance it depends upon the skill of the lawyer like for example i go back to that little example which i gave that a plaintiff relies upon his letter where he has made assertion of four facts and in a response there is no denial and no traverse of two there is an explanation of two let's take it's a contract and the reply is sent by the engineer it's possible for you to make the engineer say that look this letter was placed before me to be replied with reference to the engineering aspect of the issue which was raised these two are relating to the commercial aspect of it and so therefore when i replied to this i replied to only these two it's possible so we can't really generalize but what i'm trying to say is as we said absolute justice eludes us and what is happening is we have to also determine good justice timely justice so when we talked about uh, absolute truth evades therefore preponderance of uh, probability so let's also accept if absolute truth evades and law accepts preponderance of probability then why are we looking to absolute judgments and in the process we are making it so time consuming industry must take this risk and it's worth it so if you have 99 quick judgments and one you've gone wrong accept it because where is the proof that the other 99 with the full trial are also correct so the next question is uh, with respect to introduction of a document so i am blending two questions in one one we have received from uh, mr pradeep devan sin advocate Uh, so if re examination is permitted for explanation of matters referred to in a cross examination can a witness introduce a document by way of such explanation in re examination and what would become I, of such a document second yes, because, uh, second yes. uh, uh, question which is blended with it is uh, in stage at the stage of a cross examination can un, under order 13 rule 13 of cpc any document be put to the witness even if he is not a signatory or a party to it as the witness may by his personal knowledge admit the document further if the witness doesn't admit it can the document be placed on court file without being received in evidence right either so of the panelists let me answer the second part which is very simple during cross examination you can confront a witness with any document but subject to the objection that the document must relate to the witness it may not relate to the examination in chief of the witness now for example the witness is from the accounts department of a company and he says that only 22 bills were received in the accounts department to be cleared for payment and the defendant's case is that he had made delivery under 22 bills so your witness says that in the ordinary course of conduct of the business of our company all bills are sent to the accounts department and the accounts department then checks the price of the bill with the price under the contract and when a person certifies that the bill is as per the price then we send it to the stores department for the response that the goods are as per the specific 
uh, specifications in the contract. Now, if the suggestion relates to the specification, the lawyer should object that it doesn't relate to the witness. But if it relates to the witness, then surely the document has to be brought on record and the witness denies it will be a marked document. Why? Because during argument, you have to show to the judge which was the particular document. I've come across cases where the witness was confronted with the document, the witness had denied it, the document was not taken on record, and the appellate court was always at sea what was the particular document, and the argument was the, the witness is lying. So, you see, we, we really have to see in, in a particular circumstance of which it is. The second part of the first part of the question that if during cross examination a document which is not on the file is produced and the witness admits the document, then we always have, don't we have in uh, cross examination volunteers, the witness volunteers? Yes, but there was another document which dealt with this document and I can produce it. Or for example, if the witness is already there with his file and he's deposing to proof of documents which have been filed, he can surely pick up the document from his file that in response to this document, which has been now put to me to contradict me or to confront me, this document exists, he can surely bring it on record. Because let's all understand, what is it all about? It's all about fairness and logic. As long as there is fairness and there is logic, the whole civil procedure court, the law of evidence is always moving in the line of, as we say, to find that nugget of truth. And that's the job of the judge. I hope I've answered both your questions. Sir. Uh, so my next question is to Justice Enlo, and this is a question that has come from Mr. Abhijat. His question is that the Evidence Act permits questions to shake the credibility of a witness. However, is there a fine line between doing so and asking questions which would be in the nature of harassing a witness? Yes, it is. Uh, of course, uh, there is a fine line. And uh, Evidence Act also has a provision which says that which questions the witness can be compelled to answer and uh, which he may not be compelled to answer. But uh, again, you see what has happened is that the way in which evidence is going on today or either before the joint registrars or before the commissioner and the way the law has developed that every question is permitted to be put and only the objection so that is uh, got recorded. And even if the objecting counsel gets the matter listed before the court for resolution, a uh, number of times the factor of expediency, because either one starts hearing the entire suit at that stage, you have to go through the evidence. So generally what is happening is that the courts also say that, no, we we'll consider it at the final stage only. Before the district courts, one factor is that at the appellate stage, one never knows that what view will be taken. So therefore, we are rarely or very sparingly using that provision of not permitting the questions which are found to be uh, intended to harass the witness and not to test the veracity or the credibility of the witness thank you sir so, so, so. add with reference to an example let us take a case where the witness says that after the discussions took place the discussion started on the draft of an agreement which the defendant had brought and after on discussing making corrections additions and deletions in the draft the final type printout of the document was taken out in the plaintiff's office 
at six o'clock in the evening and it was duly signed. This is one. The second is that the witnesses general or oh, the discussions went on. They went on and on and on and on and on. He doesn't give the time and he doesn't give everything. And then he says that this document was finally scribed. It was drawn up and it was signed. Now, in second situation, if in cross-examination, the witness is put, I put it to you that the discussions went on in the hotel till late night and you broke for dinner. And the witness says, yes. Now the witness neck is in your hand. If you ask the witness, have you been treated for alcoholism? And the fellow has been. He said, this guy knows I have. He says, yes. Is it correct that you were prone to alcoholism in the month of July? Yes. Is it a fact that when you would see alcohol, you would go in for nothing less than six pegs? The guy laughs. Now here you are discrediting the credit worthiness of the witness. Why? Because this document, as per him, was finalized after they had had a dinner. He was alcoholic at that stage. He has admitted that he took six to eight pegs of alcohol. So they are good argument and good cross examination permissible. But suppose it is at six in the evening, then somebody would say, I'm not permitting you to cross examine. It's got nothing to do with his being an alcoholic. It's got nothing to do until and unless you suggest that look, even at four o'clock used to start drinking. So you see, it all depends because, but law permits the cross examination to discredit the testimony of the witness or to discredit the witness himself. And when you say the witness is being discredited, it actually means this. So the next question I'm taking is from uh, Mr. J.P. Singh, senior advocate. He's asking if a witness is to be disbelieved because of the cross-examination or if he fails during the cross-examination, can the party examine another witness on the same facts? Well, it's like this. If the party has given in the list of witnesses the names of the witnesses, then I think civil law prohibits substituting your witness. Huge prejudice would be caused to the other side because then the other witness would be tutored. That is why you see a good lawyer where two witnesses are deposing on the same set of facts does takes the permission of the court not to cross examine the first witness. He says, let the other witness also depose and I will cross-examine both the witnesses together. So the answer would be you cannot substitute your witness if your witness is um, discredited during cross-examination because the possibility of a tutored witness who would come prepared to fill up those uh, gaps would be very heavy. And let's not forget the stage at which you introduce your witness itself is used by the lawyers to argue that the witness is discredited because he's been introduced at a stage when a particular witness has already been discredited. Okay. Thank you, sir. So my next question is to Justice N. Law, sir, and uh, I'm probably going to be clubbing two questions. So the first question is, if a witness in response to a question in the cross-examination early on admits that he's not read the contents of his affidavit of evidence before signing it or admits that they are not to his personal knowledge, would a counsel in such a scenario be well advised to continue with the cross-examination on merits of the said affidavit of evidence or should he stop there? And a follow-up to the question is also, uh, so do standard cross-examination questions that we've often heard as to where did you sign this to elicit a response, whether you signed it before a notary or not, do they serve any purpose? So I'm just clubbing these two questions together, sir. If uh, the witness has, uh, in, the, in response to the initial questioning, said that uh, 
he has not read the epidemic or he is not aware of the contents according to me the best course is to put a stop immediately to further cross examination because if the witness is otherwise aware of the facts and is truthful and you cross examine him on the contents and he gives the correct answer so then that uh, case would his case would be fortified the golden rule of cross examination is uh, not to ask a question the answer to which you don't know what that witness will give so uh, we see a lot of excessive cross examination now so cross examination is equally important about where to stop then as important as what to ask and and uh, uh, how much to ask now the second uh, see uh, the view taken by most of the courts according to me is that uh, those questions about did you go to the oath commissioner or the notary uh, where was the affidavit prepared they don't really take us anywhere because of practice as this is a uh, classic case of where the practice has overtaken the law the practice we all know how it happens that uh, the affidavits are uh, as justice nandra jo said earlier the affidavits are verbatim uh, repetition of the uh, pleadings in fact uh, in a large number of cases i have also found the paragraphs relating to cause of action territorial jurisdiction valuation in the affidavit and one of course was a extreme case where the advocate for the defendant that was the defendant affidavit he also said that this judgment holds this this judgment holds this and the judgments were also annexed to the affidavit and when the lawyer was asked about it he said you think i am going to come to address final arguments now whatever i had to say i said in this so uh, the in that asking so unless it's a very some special facts of that case give you an additional advantage by asking all that according to me those questions need not be asked that uh, did you go to the oath commissioner where was the affidavit prepared it's best to proceed with the merits so seeing uh, i just said back to thomas probably we are running out of time yes <laughs> Seeing Ajay back on the screen is a cue for us. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> the number of questions we have received over a hundred questions. So I think we will have to do a sequel of this uh, in in the near future to answer all those uh, interesting questions that we have received. But for the time being, uh, because of the paucity of time, we will have to put a hard stop. I am grateful to Honorable Justice Endlo and Honorable Justice Pradeep Nandrajog for sparing time and addressing this uh, fundamental issue, which uh, us as young lawyers and many seasoned practitioners face in in day-to-day -day practice. And uh, I'm also grateful to Kanika, my able co-moderator, for conducting these proceedings with me. And many thanks to Manurashna University and Ajay Thomas for providing all the support and help. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, we'll meet soon if the panelists agree yeah. for a seat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to. We don't repeat our three rhymes the same way again. Thank yes, you. Seeing everybody in person. <laughs> so that we can do some personal cross examination of each other. <laughs>